Hello, I'm Max from the University of Southampton. In this video, we are looking into the simplest wave theory. It has many names, every waves, small amplitude waves, or even first order Stokes waves. But we will refer to this kind of waves as linear waves, and look at what the linear wave theory has to offer. Waves are complicated, there are many types of waves. Body waves are waves that travel through a material, such as sound waves and seismic waves. Standing waves occur in the example of plugging a guitar string where distinct nodes of zero amplitude exist. However, we are only concerned with surface waves, which are the ones occurring at the interface between the atmosphere and the water body. Linear wave theory has many simplifications that allow for a quick analysis of a wave's properties it is often used in ocean and coastal engineering. In this video, we'll look at some of the assumptions and equations we can use. We will not go through the derivation of the equations, but we will visually demonstrate the characteristics of the waves generated in the flume. To kick off, we begin by describing the shape and the characteristics of a linear wave. For the wave to be linear, it must be of small amplitude and follow a sinusoidal shape. Crests are the highest points in the wave, and troughs are the lowest points in the wave. Wavelength is the distance between two identical points, for example, the distance between two adjacent crests. Amplitude is the maximum displacement from its central value, or half the distance between the crest and the trough. We're now moving on to the assumptions that are applied in the linear wave theory. First, we look at the assumptions that restrict the physical situation considered. Number one, constant water depth, so a flat bottom. Number two, periodic wave with a period t, or constant frequency. Number three, two-dimensional motion horizontal in x and vertical in z. And finally, number four, the Coriolis force and vorticity due to the Earth's rotation are ignored. Then we have the following approximations. Number one, the boundary layer effects that occur near the walls are neglected because the boundary layer is relatively thin compared to the water depth. Number two, neglect viscous and turbulent stresses so that the wave motion is considered fully irrotational. And finally, number three, the wave amplitude is relatively small compared to the wavelength. Based on these assumptions, we can use potential flow theory, which we will not explore here. What you need to know is that potential flow theory applies to fluids that are considered to be irrotational, which is actually a good approximation for non-breaking linear waves. In any case, this theory allows us to obtain some important predictions about the properties of waves, which we will explore next. Based on the wavelength and the depth over which waves propagate, they may be considered as shallow water, intermediate water, and deep water waves. The conditions are such that the ratio of depth to wavelength is less than 1 20th for shallow water and between 1 20th to a half for intermediate water, and larger than half for deep water. Wave speed or celerity of propagation C can be understood as the speed at which a wave crest or trough propagates. In other words, the distance L that the wave travels over a time T. Of course, the distance can be the wavelength itself and T would then be the period, which is why sometimes in textbook you will see the celerity defined as wavelength divided by the wave period. This is the general equation for the celerity of a linear wave, propagating over any depth, developed from potential flow theory. This equation can be simplified depending on the ratio of depth to wavelength. For shallow water, wave celerity is determined by the water depth. For intermediate water, we have to use the full general equation. And for deep water, the wave celerity depends only on the wavelength. 
We can also use this general equation and the definition for celerity to obtain expressions that relate the wavelength and the wave period. Before I begin to show you the results from the flume, I'll explain the setup. The flume is long and here's just an illustration of the main components. We have the wave maker on the far end that creates a wave with a frequency that is determined by a waveform generator. The probes are used to obtain the waveform which is displayed on an oscilloscope. This is a wave at around 1.2 Hz. I could determine the wavelength in a rigorous way using data from the oscilloscope, but instead I'll do it in a more intuitive way that hopefully you'll find it easy to understand. In order to determine the wavelength, I placed a still image in Microsoft Paint. First, I measured the 30 cm ruler in pixels, which is 224 pixels. And then I measure the crest to crest distance and the wavelength is 817 pixels. By working out the factor of how much the wavelength is bigger than the ruler, we can then multiply the actual length of the ruler to work out the wavelength in centimeter. As I said, this is not the most accurate result, but as we'll see later, it's not far from reality. Now that we have the wavelength, let's try to use the equations discussed previously. The depth to wavelength ratio is 0 0.64, which is larger than 0 0.5, so it is under the deep water regime. Using the deep water approximation, the wave celerity is 1.31 meter per second. But what happens if we use the general equation instead? Well, we also get 1.31 meter per second. We have just verified that the simplification of the general equation for the deep water is correct. Here's a waveform from the oscilloscope. The blue wave is the data taken from the probe nearer to the wave maker and the probe at some distance away produced the purple wave. The x axis shows time with each vertical strip being 0 0.25 seconds width. The wave period can simply be obtained as 1 divided by our frequency, which in this case is 1.2 Hz. So we have a period of 0 0.83 seconds. We can double check this value by using data from the oscilloscope. By measuring the time between two adjacent crests on the same wave, we see that the wave period is roughly 0.825 seconds. And then we can use the definition of celerity, wavelength of a period, which gives us 1.31 meter per second, which is the same as what we had. Using the wavelength to wave period relationship, we get the wavelength to be 1.084 meter, which deviates by less than 1% from the estimate we obtained with our simple method previously. Now, I'll give you a problem to solve. I tell you that the distance between the two probes that display results in the oscilloscope is 2.32 meters. How could you use this image of the oscilloscope data to obtain directly the celerity? Come back later to think about it. Share your answer in the comment section. Now let's look at three waves at different frequencies. Starting from the top, we have a 1.4 hertz, then 1.2 hertz and finally 1 Hz. Using the same method of calculating wavelength previously, we get these values. The depth of water remains 0 0.7 meter, so the ratio of depth to wavelength are shown. From there, we worked out the celerity for each wave. As you can see, the longer the wavelength, the faster the wave propagates. Watch the videos again and see if you can spot the difference in the speed of waveform propagation. This has implications for the important phenomenon of frequency dispersion, but we will not talk about that in this video. We will now cover the motion of a particle in a wave. 
You see, a lot of people think that water propagates with the waveform, but actually, water under the influence of surface waves follows orbital motions. Let's look at this small ball placed near the surface. You clearly see that it follows near circular paths, which is also predicted by the linear wave theory. However, what linear wave theory doesn't predict is that, as you can see, the ball is also drifting slightly in the direction of the wave propagation. This drifting is a nonlinear effect not accounted for by this relatively simple theory. Finally, I want to show you how this orbital motion of the ball decreases as it moves through the depth of the water. I've tracked this particle on the top right. As a comparison, you can see the orbital motion of the ball is getting smaller and smaller, while the particle nearer to the surface still have a large diameter of motion. Linear wave theory also predicts this decrease in the motion towards the bottom. As it sinks slowly to the bottom, I would like to take this time to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, like and comment below.